We're proud to welcome you to the Exceptional Advisor podcast series brought to you by the Investments and Wealth Institute. This series aims to help you to better serve your clients, differentiate yourself from the competition, and enhance your ability to communicate those differences. Hi, I'm your host, Bob Powell. My guest today is Jamie Hopkins. Jamie is the managing partner of Wealth Solutions at Carson Wealth. He's also a finance professor of practice at Creighton University, and he's a regular contributor to Forbes Investment News and Market Watch. So welcome to the podcast, Jamie. Hey, good to see you, and thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. Now, before we get going, for the, for the benefit of those who may not be familiar with your work, the very few who may not be familiar with you and your work, do you mind giving us a, an overview? Yeah, I was about to make the joke, well, that's almost everybody, but um, <laughs> it... Yeah, so I, I hold a couple different roles out there in the world, and I'll try to boil it down. Um, you know, first one is I'm, I'm now managing partner at Carson Group, uh, sit over across advanced solutions, so financial planning, our coaching company, events and marketing. I've been with Carson about three years full time. Before that, I, I was a professor at American College, and I, I still have a professorship at Creighton University in the financial planning program there. I'm president of FinSurf Foundation, which is a nonprofit that helps with uh, really getting students into the financial services profession. So that's been probably one of the more rewarding things I've done. And, and I should mention, or you should mention that you're the author of a book now in its second edition. Yeah, I'm the worst, uh, you know, I guess that's dropping those things. So I've, I've, I wrote the book, Rewirement, Rewirement, Rewiring the Way You Think About Retirement. It is in the second edition, which will be my last edition of the book. Um, I own the trademark for that. It's, it's been fun. I do have a project coming out next year around rewirement, but uh, I probably am done with the book. I've, I, I think that two editions is fine. I'll do something else next. <laughs> All right. That's fair. So um, turnabout is fair play. I was once on your podcast and I think you asked me, was it about favorite foods or mm-hmm. something? Yeah. So let's do that. Uh, mm-hmm. Turnabout is fair play. What's yeah. your favorite? Uh, so what I tell people is it's cheeseburgers. Like if I have to pick a style of food, like cheeseburgers are my favorite thing. Um, when I go to new cities, I'm always asking people where's the best burger and I try to go find it. And uh, uh, a couple of things though about that is like, I do when I go to a place, like uh, I want to see like, what's your standard burger? Like that, that's what I want to try. You know, lots of places do really crazy burgers and they'll pile everything under the sun on it. They might be good, but anyone can honestly just throw a hundred different things onto a burger. I want to see that American cheese burger bun, you know, and, and just taste that one first. I, I like the other burgers too, but that's the one I go to when I try uh, different cities and try to figure out which burger I like. All right. So you must have a favorite burger at a favorite restaurant in a favorite city. Uh, I do. So um, it's actually Vortex, uh, which is in Atlanta. There's at least two locations there. And that's that's probably my favorite cheeseburger in the country um, and has been for some time now. Uh, there's a downtown location that one a little bit outside of the city. And the, the one outside of the city, you actually walk through like a big skull. Um, it's a very cool entrance too. But uh, I, I believe both of them are 18 and over restaurants too. I don't think that, I think they're the smoking ones. So like like not everybody can actually go there. I don't smoke, but just for people, if you go, you're like, oh, I'm going to take my kids to go there. I don't think that they let kids into those ones there in Atlanta. So that's All right, So the surprising thing about your favorite food is as, as a runner, I would not have pegged you for a fan of cheeseburgers. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's fuel, right? I mean, I, I eat a lot. Uh, I've been eating a lot this week. I'm, I'm gearing up for the Philly marathon. I would like to be losing weight, which has not been successful, but I am, I, that might be my last marathon. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but, uh, going to run Philly, just survive and finish and then decide if I want to run any more, but that could be it. So it might be yeah, the last well, one. Well, I guess in Philly, you have to have a cheesesteak after you're done, not a cheeseburger. Yeah. Um, I, I did used to eat cheeseburgers afterwards. So there was a, there's a, there's a bar and restaurant that I used to always go to. That was like my post Philly marathon or run uh, staple. That restaurant's now gone. So I, I don't know where I'm going to go, but I will probably have a cheeseburger, not a cheesesteak afterwards. Cause I like the cheesesteak restaurants typically aren't sit down. Right. So we're, we're going pretty deep into the Philly culture, but they're more, you know, you grab your cheesesteak, you walk around and eat it. And uh, yeah. some of them have sit down, but I, th- I think the last time I was in Philly, I went to Delos Sandro's, which was mm-hmm. on the top five, I think. Right. Yeah. Delos Sandro's Jim's on South street. 
Um, you know, Pat's and Gino's are the famous ones, you know, most, you know, I'm not a huge fan of theirs, but uh, they've obviously put, they've put the, the cheesesteak on the map. So it's a good <laughs> one. And then near me for people who are, you know, ever go by the Villanova area, I do believe that campus corner at the edge of Villanova university has one of the best cheesesteaks in the country too. Um, so uh, that's a, that's kind of, I don't know if I call it a hidden gem, but it's not your downtown location, but All if right. you're in the suburbs, that's probably my favorite. All right. And of course, um, always wit. <laughs> yeah. Well, with onions, I'm not a cheese whiz fan, but. Um... <laughs> All right. So let's, let's get to it. Um, I want to learn more about what you're doing in the world of coaching, because I think that is a, um, a, a seldom discussed, but, but much necessary topic. Yeah, especially in our business, uh, you know, we have a lot of financial advisors. We got a lot of financial professionals. We don't have a lot of coaching businesses. We have a lot of individuals that do coaching um, as a job. Uh, it's hard to scale coaching as a business. Um, there's probably only three or four of us that I say have done that well in our space. Um, you know, Ron Carson did that well back into the 90s. Our coaching business has been around since 1993. So uh, been around a long time. It's changed names a couple of times from peak uh, peak alliance and has been Carson coaching now since I've been uh, part of it. And we only coach financial advisors. I mean, that's it, uh, full stop. And we work with about 1400 advisors at any given time, which it puts us, I don't know if we're the largest, but in the top couple of uh, coaching and tends to be, you know, uh, and I say advisors in the true sense, not um, most like not 99% insurance and additional financial plan. I mean, we're working with advisors that are fiduciaries and start with that and, and really focus on planning. And we really focus on the practice management side of it. It's kind of this, the systems processes, content strategies that have helped RIA scale over the last 20 years. And we're constantly updating that. I have about 15 people on my team now in the coaching company. Um, they're fantastic from Dr. Jerry Harbison, Dr. Julie Rag, it's Greg Opitz, who was one of the founding people on CFP board and ran the education there for 15 years. Um, so I, you know, I always feel that, you know, people differentiate companies. And I feel that's the same from us too, that the, our coaches are, all, you know, I think they're all 10 plus years of experience in the advisory business. And I think that's just different out there. You need that. And then they push people. I mean, that's the hard part about coaching is that, you know, I've had, I've had a lot of great sports coaches over my life too. And the best ones have to push you. I mean, they, you can be, you can get along with them. You've got to connect, but they've got to hold you accountable and push you forward. And that's one of the probably most valuable things about any coach is that accountability partner. Right. So practice management, I, I take it that means everything from operations to marketing to hiring to just running the firm, right? Yeah, we, we use a term. Some, we have a couple terms we use, but like unleash your full potential or, you know, kind of uh, we help you run your business so it doesn't run you. Those are really the things that we focus on. And I'd say 90 percent of people who join us are joining because they want to grow in some shape or form. And that doesn't always mean I want more clients, I want more revenue. Growth can be, I want to scale down clients, but be as profitable and have time to do other things, right? That's a form of growth, but it is a, is a type of growth. You got to get more profitable with what you have. So, uh, but a lot of people are coming in, you know, how do I market better? Do I need to change strategies? Who do I need to hire? What seats do I need to fill? What processes I just don't have that some of them are easy and uh, they just haven't seen them. They haven't seen them documented. We have about, uh, about 1,100 uh, different documents that we have built for advisory firms. So we have a lot of people that just come in and they grab a bunch of documents. They use some of them verbatim. They modify some and that gets you 80% of the way there and with a coach kind of driving uh, really helps people grow their business and get that scale and that freedom that you might be looking for when you, you know, we get people that come in. I remember a guy who joined during the pandemic and he just said, you know, I've been growing like crazy, but I hate my life every time somebody calls. <laughs> He says, I feel upset when somebody calls and says, you know, I really want you as my advisor because he was so over his head with clients. Yeah. He had no scale. He had terrible systems. He didn't have the right people in any of the right seats. And I mean, again, right, that's a form of growth because you are miserable. And that's so sad to hear when you have somebody who's doing well, but just as miserable. And, uh, 
you know, that's th that case was mostly around just processes. They just didn't, the onboarding was taking 90 plus days and, you know, they just didn't have clean systems. It was all ad hoc and uh, to get people into things, but obviously related with people and they trusted them. So I, I'll, I, would, I do want to talk more about the, the actual process of hiring you as a coach, but I, I'm interested in the biggest issues that you now see in the world of um, financial advice advisors. Yeah, I know we talked about this a little bit before. I'll lay out three or four real quick and we'll dive into a couple of them. A big one's technology. Just, you know, technology is constantly changing. There's so many new tech providers out there. How do the systems integrate? A lot of systems say they integrate, right? They're integratable, but nothing's actually integrated. Mm. Uh, that's a huge pain point for advisors out there today. So getting focus on that. Uh, one's human capital. That used to not be on our top five list of why people were with us. Uh, five years ago, it wasn't even on the list. And then all of a sudden this last year, it has now moved up to number two, uh, which is a big deal, right? It, people don't know where to hire people. They're struggling with succession planning in the sense that I don't have a good number two advisor that can take over the business. I can't find a chief operating officer. I can't find, you know, you go down the list and it's just a big challenge today. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the other one's just growth. I, I, the, and I mean true growth here, organic growth. How do I get more clients? I rarely run into an advisor that says either I don't want new clients or two, I don't want a good advisor with clients with the three to five years of experience. Everyone wants that person. <laughs> right. So those are two things that everyone's looking for uh, the coming around that. And then the other one I mentioned before too, it's, it's almost this degree of burnout. And a lot of it's happening in those, you know, six to eight inches in, inside of your head. You're just not focusing on the right things. And so we get a lot of that too, where it's delegation. And how do you get to a mental space where you're trusting your team and delegating? Sometimes that's just getting getting the right systems and processes in place and you trust them, but that holds a lot of people back. It's, you know, from my roles have shifted a lot. I mean, since you've known me, right, I was um, in a team of like three at the American College where, you know, that we just did what we need to do. And there's a very small team. And I think I have 120 people or something that roll up to me now. Like, I've had to learn to delegate. I don't know that I'm great at it. That's a different question for other people. But, you know, it, it's the same thing mentally, like trusting that somebody else can carry through with it. And if you don't trust that person, is that because of you or do you have the wrong person in the wrong seat or you don't have the right process? So sometimes this, you know, when working with a coach, it's challenging the person that came in on what's going on inside their head, finding the right mindset so you can achieve the things you want to achieve. Right. Um, so when you talk about human capital and hiring, is it because there aren't there isn't enough supply or what what's the issue that that you see out there yeah this one there's not a perfect answer to this there's a, there is a supply issue in one sense that you know i don't believe that there are enough trained up people for the roles that people are looking for today that doesn't mean there aren't enough talented people <laughs> available to fill those roles but a lot of places so if you're a four person firm and you've got, you know, you know, a director of first impressions, maybe you have a planner, you've got an operations person, you're the advisor, and there's your team. And you say, I really need a second advisor with experience on how to go out and get clients and work them and do everything. You've got to train that person if you're bringing somebody new in. Yeah. Reality is you probably have one person in that whole team that can train them, which is you, yeah. <laughs> and you're already too busy. Right. So that doesn't work very well. It's not that there's not somebody out there that can do that job. It's that every advisor wants the person with five years of experience that magically went through some training that hasn't existed now in our profession for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And so that person doesn't really exist. And that's a big challenge for you know what I would say, even mid-sized firms, it's very hard. How do you put a team around to train people. Um, you know, Carson, I'd say we're mid-sized to the large on, on the Carson partner side. And like we, you know, we just kind of have that in the last two years. And so when I think about other firms that are, you know, five to 10 people, it's very hard to train for some of those. Yeah. So then instead, what we hear is, oh, there's nobody available. Oh, there's no good people. Well, there are, but we have a training issue here too. The other thing is there's a lot of advisors that I, I think we talked about just the mindset. They get stuck in their own mind on what, what success looks like here. 
I had an advisor and he was at one of our events not too long ago. And he said something like, I've gone through three succession plan advisors that I brought in. They've all left. And then he made the comment about, you know, I don't know what's wrong with this next generation. They, they, they just don't want to put in the work. And, you know, you, you look at that and, you, you know, you go into, oh, how much were you paying them? He's like, oh, well, I don't want to pay them until they, they prove themselves. Right. And so paying them nothing, expecting them to be here and then eventually take over the business. And none of them had ownership yet. And they've all left. And then you have this person who's now nearing the later stage of the career doesn't have a backup. And I'm just thinking, sitting there thinking like, you know, like when you go through three times of it not working, you have to have that moment where maybe it wasn't them. <laughs> yeah, right. right? <laughs> And you're doing very well, but reality is if you keep trying to keep all that compensation, keep all that ownership, and you're not willing to share that with your team, you're going to continue to lose people. I think it's very important. We, you know, you and I have talked about career paths before. What I see people coming out of school, if they're coming out of CFP or some type of training program, they want a path to ownership. When they look out at the world today, it's all about what do you own, right? Are you owning crypto? Are you owning stock directly? Are you buying prop? Like, I mean, that's if you go on all these things, it's all about ownership. They want to know that there's a path to that. And very few places clearly lay out a path. I think that's a huge advantage if you can say, Say, here is what we expect from you. Here's a path to own something. It doesn't have to be a large piece, but ownership matters to people. Yeah. I think that we need to adopt that as a profession and, and get to that. The whole sink or swim, call your 10 best family and 100 best family and friends yeah. needs to go away as soon as possible. If you're still using that, I, I challenge you to think about different mindsets. Student loans put an issue on that too. You know, there's a, a group that wants more security and, and pay, and we have seen a little bit of a shift there, right, to starting with more and more salary-based positions and shifting over time versus, you know, it used to be the opposite, right? Like, go figure out how to make money. And But if you have a, if you have a set expense that's already there, that doesn't work well. Yeah. And uh, so those are all challenges. Um, there's some side challenges, too. I, I wanted to bring up the CPA world. That one's on my mind constantly. Uh it's going to be an issue for COIs. It's going to be an issue if you're offering tax services. Uh, you know, they're getting burnout. It's just a reality. We've gone through 2017 end of the year tax cut and job act to really now just four, like three slash four years of constant tax law changes, extended seasons for two years. Um, we're seeing it when we talk to CPA firms. We talk to advisors that work with CPAs. I had I had one guy that was telling me uh, just last week. He goes, you know, we referred out to this one CPA in the middle of the tax season. The guy just retired, and there was a voicemail <laughs> saying up that I'm, I, I've since retired. I'm not working with any new clients. And he's like, that was it, right? <laughs> he was just done. <laughs> middle of tax season, and uh, you, you know, that's a scary thing when that's where you referred everyone to go. You know, do your your. You know, do their taxes. And, you know, I, I'm like, yeah, that's scary. And what I really worry about this is, uh, you know, if you go and look at a, you know, a lot of the CPA uh, material that's coming out, they know that burnout's a really big deal. People are just leaving the profession and it creates this kind of lost generation. If we get another tax bill passed here at the end of the year, I worry about that. What happens with all this dropout over the next two years? And do we really run short of people? I think taxes have gotten as complicated as they've ever been. I know we heard tax cut and job act. We'll fill it out on the back of the postcard. I, I don't think anyone's ever seen that. And I don't see anything coming in this new legislation. If it passes simplifying anything, right? It's just more and more complex. Uh, we, we still need people turbo tax and tax software has done really well, but when you look at a lot of this stuff, it just doesn't work well. I mean, I've, I was trying to help somebody with a uh, 1999 cap a, uh, stuff in TurboTax. And we, I think I spent six hours on the phone with all their CPAs and enrolled agents and like nobody could figure out how to make it work in the system. Right. And we just gave up and we pulled everything out and we had to go do it um, outside because we just couldn't figure it out. Yeah. And so even for as great as these systems are, when you get down to some of the really complex stuff, it matters. And for advisors, a lot of your clients own businesses and it gets complex where a standardized system, no matter how good it is, will have faults. And so I worry about that if we lose a bunch of CPAs, what's that impact on the advisory business, right? All yeah. these people we like to refer to. Yeah. I mean, at the moment, if memory serves, we have about 100,000 CPAs in this country that are that are involved in individual tax prep, uh, maybe another 100,000 or so doing audit yes. work for corporations, yeah. but... <laughs> yeah. 
and, and the scary part about that is like, let's just say you lose 10% over the next three years for some yeah. reason, right? The problem is not that they're gone right then. It's that there's not a fast way to fill them back up, right? It's a, it's a, it's a true supply chain issue. Like when you see things, like when you stop working on something, but it takes 18 months to build it, it's not the fact that there's a shortage in two weeks. It's the fact that to fill in a lost group of CPAs will take another 10 years, right? Yeah. Like if we lose 10% of the 10 to 15 year really talented people in the middle of the CPA careers, they're 45 to 50, we can't refill them quickly, right? Right. <laughs> right? right. Like that's a problem. Um, <laughs> no matter how much we put back into schools and invest and start a new CPA program at our local university, we now have a 20 year problem that is not easy yep. to fix. So that's a, that's a scary thing when you start thinking about careers and that's happened in different professions before, yeah. right? Where we just get these gaps and we don't have people. Yeah. So what's your best advice to an advisor who is worried about this to work with a, a, a CPA in their 20s or 30s who versus someone who's in their 50s or 60s. Yeah, so this is something, um, I mean, this is very specific. I think that uh, advisory firms need to think about recruiting CPAs in long term now too. Uh, so a lot of firms started working with the CFP program. So we just assumed that there were going to be CPA firms that we could refer to forever. Reality is that might not be the case. If you're also watching the M&A world, what are, uh, what are advisory firms doing? They are buying up CPA firms. There's a lot of reasons. The multiples yep. are much worse. So you can buy them up, pull clients, in and you actually improve your, you know, if you're thinking about um, your, your firm value, you've increased your firm value through an acquisition. Um, and you can cut a lot of clients. You don't need, right? If you're an advisory firm and I have 500 clients and I see a CPA firm filing 1,400 taxes, I don't need 1,400 tax returns at $295 each. Right. I need you to really serve well my 500 clients. And we make a lot more money off of this anyway. Yeah. And if you bring in 100 good clients, we've grown tremendously. So that M&A is still going to occur out there. But I really think that um, when we're talking about recruiting young talent, going to the accounting departments and looking for people who might want to come into an advisory firm and be you know, a standard filer and take their enrolled agent and, and walk in that career and yeah. help with the tax planning side throughout the year, but really help manage some of those higher end clients. Yeah. That's going to, I just see that growing and growing. Um, so looking out there and to some degree, what you were doing there is you were then controlling more and more of the client experience. Yeah. And if you think about where I think most firms are trying to get to, or how do we scale the feel of a family office? So the more of those services we can partner white label or bring in house, the stronger we will get. A lot of that is outsourcing, right? We got to find good partners, but if you can, that could be a way to kind of protect that experience and long-term value. Yeah. I, I do want to talk about the client experience, but it strikes me that having that expertise in-house can go a long way, especially if you're working with a client and you're talking about partial Roth conversions and going up to the next marginal bracket, or maybe someone owns rental uh, uh, rental, uh, you know, rental income property and you know all the complexities that come with that. I mean, it just seems like to outsource that expertise when you claim to be a comprehensive planner yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> sort of strikes me as a disconnect. Yeah, it, it does feel the last maybe five years CPAs and uh, advisors got a little bit closer. Maybe some of my perception has been off just on where I've sat too. But I, you know, I, you probably remember this too. Ten years ago, I mean, CPAs hated Roth conversions, like right. hated them, and it was a complete pain for a lot of advisors to work with any CPAs because they'd go, "Oh, we need to do bracket bumping conversions." And the CPA would come back and be like, why in the world are we paying more taxes this year? Right. Like never pay more taxes. Right. Like our, my whole job is to keep you from paying more taxes. <laughs> and, you know, there's still some of that out there. I mean, I, I probably every advisor that listens to this can think of a time when they've had a CPA come back and give conflicting information based on what they were saying. Yeah. And then you've created this weird relation where like, well, who do they trust now? Do they listen to me? Do they listen to the CPA? Do I have to call and talk to the CPA? Are they calling and talking to me? But you can reduce down some of that, but you bring on other issues, right? If you mess up a filing, then now that's on you too, right? So it's not that it's risk-free when you bring that in-house. Right.
Um, you mentioned the CPA supply chain. Uh, I, uh, not only I, but many worry about the um, the aging of the financial advisor and what happens there. You have a contrary point of view about that. Yeah. Well, I agree that it's happening, <laughs> right? We, we have fewer and fewer advisors, right, than we've ever had before. We've got less advisors than we had back in the, the 90s, client facing, and we're going to have fewer advisors in 10 years than we have today. Yeah. Um, they're aging, uh, right? What, what do we have more? We have more over 30 or like more over 80 than under 30, right. whatever that yeah. number is. Which, right? I, think, which just, I think quite frankly is explainable, but that's a, well, that's for a story. Right. That, yeah. yeah. Like there, there is a reason, right? Like obviously there's less people in the workforce between like 22 and yeah. 30 in professional client facing careers too, than business owners that in our profession, we know that they don't really, really retire. They just hang on forever. Because yeah. right. they don't want to sell their business, right? Yeah. <laughs> So there, there are some explainable things about that, but it's probably not a good number either way, right? Right. <laughs> um, it, but when you look at that, I mean, that trend's not going to change. There is no pipeline that's going to refill that. There's no investment that's going to change it. Um, I also say, you know, that the personal finance world, the advisory world is not um, sexy to the next generation. They all still think there's some sales component with it. Even when I talk to CFP students in good programs, like you'll talk to people at Texas Tech, University of Illinois, Clemson. Uh, Winthrop, University of Georgia. And, you know, I talked to these, you know, 20 year olds, 21 year olds, and they still view this world as a sit like a very heavy sales component. Yeah. Um, they don't have the experience that there's other careers in it, even in programs. So when you think about that, you expand that out to the general population, I don't expect it to change. Now, where I go on this side is, I think that the tax software is more mature on the do-it-yourself side. So I don't see like a huge disruption occurring there in the sense that like we need as many CPAs as we have today because I don't see TurboTax getting 10x better over the next five years, Yeah, right? I think it's really good. And not just picking TurboTax, but I think the tax planning softwares out there are pretty good for do-it-yourselfers. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's true for personal finance at all. I think that our technology is a decade behind everyone. Yeah. So I do feel that over the next five years, there are going to be a lot better technologies, both for do-it-yourselfers and for advisors to, in, like the integration between technology should get a lot better over the next five years, which to me should allow more you know, advisors to serve more clients in a better capacity than they ever have before. So I don't have as big of a concern about it. I actually, when I talk to people, I'm like, this is great news. If you're in this business or want to be in this business, we're going to have fewer and fewer advisors. We have more and more people that need our help. And technology is actually going to allow us to serve these people better and better over the next decade. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I actually view that as a huge opportunity if you're in this business, survive, right? Like be good enough over the next five years, be enough forward looking for technology that you have, you know, you don't have to build it all. You don't have to go invest and start yeah. coding, but watch what's happening, have the right partner be ready. And you're going to be very, I, I think we're going to be very successful over this time period. I don't have that same fear, but it's because our technology is so bad today. And I really do mean that. Like when you talk to, so we went through the minority deal with Bain Capital this summer, but I think we looked at 20 some people that looked at uh, Carson. And we heard this from so many of these, uh, you know, uh, private equity and investment shops, they were like, the great thing about the advisory business today is that we're years behind everybody else. Yeah. Like what we're investing in, in Silicon Valley and AI, like in the stuff that's in the financial advisory world is so rudimentary on that. Right. But that's really exciting to these places because they know that that growth, that kind of explosive J curve growth is all in front. But you can't just say, I'm going to keep doing the same thing I was doing 10 years ago and be successful for the next 10 years. Um, but I don't think you have to build it all either, right? I mean, I think that's encouraging, right? That's exciting if you're in this space today. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> so as, you, as you're describing this, this trend, I'm, I'm also conscious of the fact that so many roll-ups are going on today. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about how that affects the, the outcome here? 
Yeah, I don't see those stopping either. <laughs> um, it, not if multiples stay anywhere near where they are, right? I mean, roll-ups today are a large part because people have built valuable businesses and sticky client relationships. Um, so like the net present value of a client relationship is really strong. And so the value of the firm is really strong. And we're seeing that right as people moved away from transactional-based approaches of commission and product sales, the, the advisory businesses and AUMs, the, you know, the business world says, hey, these are better businesses, period, right? Full stop. We don't, you know, you can get into the arguments about what's the best comp model, but the business world was very clear. Like, this is a better business, <laughs> right? right? Like, we, we, we expect it to be a more successful long run. Um, the other thing is, you know, the market has a lot to do with that. If, you, if you've been in this business, you think about the average advisors, what, like almost 60 years old or whatever, and the market's gone up for 10 years straight, basically. And at this point, clients are pretty sticky. You, you've got a lot of value you've probably created at that point. So if you can take something off the table it makes sense to me. Uh, we're seeing a lot of advisors do that, right? There'll be more M&A deals done in 2021 20, uh, than any year prior. There were more in 2020. There were more in 2019. Right. With looking at the tax bill, not taking capital gains up to 39.6%. Looks like I would put my money on 2022 will be the most M&A and right. roll-up deals that we've ever seen before right. too. And yeah. You know, that's I, I think there's some downside to the market for that, too. You can always argue that, you know, we have this fragmentation and um, kind of a competition that's probably healthy to some degree. However, if you talk to some other people, I remember talking to uh, Mark Cassidy about this. And, you know, he's like, you know, if you look at that, though, and you look at the cost associated with everything in financial services in the U.S., I think we're like a net negative um, because we have so many inefficiencies, right? Like we've totally lost scale as an industry. Yeah. And that's actually kind of harmful, right? Like if we roll up a bunch of people and we're all doing the same thing anyway, we get a lot more efficient and then we can actually reduce costs down to end clients, which in the long run is a good thing for the profession. Yeah. So if you're a small independent, at one point you had to compete against the large brokerage firms. Now you have to compete against the large, whatever, right? Creative focus, <laughs> name the entity. Yeah. Um, yeah. What what chance do you have? Is it is it um, uh, you're more personalized and 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 less? Um, but what is it? How do you compete in that world? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's always good to to put out my own bias before somebody listens and said, of course, he's saying that, right? Like, I mean, we don't view ourselves as an aggregator at Carson, right? Like we do buy places, but mostly people come and partner. But if you think about it in the marketplace, it's a similar competition model, right? We're, we're getting efficiencies at scale with our advisors and they're growing faster than the independent uh, individuals are. And there's reasons for that, right? We help with marketing. Like, you know, we help with technology and the integrations. You're not the chief technology officer anymore. So when I look at that, I mean, I, I just think that you'd be, if you want to grow your business and be competitive in 15 or 20 years, I think you've got to find something. And I'm not saying it's Carson or Focus-esque. Maybe there's, you know, there, you know, you can think about XYPN and you're part of a community and you're learning from others and but you've got to find something in my view. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's always, you know, you can run a very nice business and be local and you can dominate your local market. And that'll be, you know, I don't think there's any argument that that goes away completely. But if you look at something like the Amazon effects had at mom and pop shops and originally the mom and pop bookstores, which they just decimated, right? Mm -hmm. Like absolutely decimated them. Yeah. And it was, it was a scale issue, right? That eventually you could actually offer a more personalized service at scale. Mm -hmm. And that's the one thing that like when people say, oh yeah, but people want that personal side. And I said, that's true, but at scale, we could become more personal because I can you know, with a great marketing and technology team, we can geolocate, we can know the client's going to a baseball field, they've got a 15 year old son, and then send them materials on how to fund college, because, and you know, that's going to them, you, you're not going to be able to do that as a solo practitioner out there in the market, right. we can automate messages. So when it's two months before their kids 18th birthday, they're getting a message saying, hey, you know, I, I know your son's turning daughter's turning 18, and she's going to do this. And that's coming automatically from a system again gets very hard to do that um if it's a solo person so i i don't believe truly that 
uh, personalization goes away at scale, I think it's going to get better. Netflix is a great example. You log in and they're giving you all the stuff you should watch. What do you like, right? What is, yeah. what is Robert like? Oh, Bob Powell exists. Okay. These are the other people like you that also like this. And, um, you know, Amazon's the best example because you go on there and you see all this stuff you should buy that's all personalized to you, right? And they're pre-shipping stuff near you because they know what your preferences are. Yeah. You know, we're going to get closer and closer to that in the advisory business with technology, with AI. You know, we're to the point where, right, we're going to start pre-guessing people's needs and their planning ahead of time before they even come up because we know what 10,000 other clients just like them at that point in their life where they started looking at and what they started needing. And that's where scale and efficiency actually brings more personalization, not less. Yeah. So um, I guess talk, I mean, that all speaks to the client experience. Um, I, I, obviously, are, are we lacking in that regard right now? Or, or how do you view that in its current state? Yeah, I don't, I don't think the advisors lack in current uh, client experience. I just think we rely a lot, very heavily on the personal interaction for the client experience today. Mm -hmm. And I mean, client experience goes to all types of things, right? It goes to how is your office set up? Is your office set up encouraging to people for sharing? Does it look like a place where people want to be? Um, you know, things like your Zoom and your lighting and your sound and your audio, your emails, do they look bad? Do they look clunky? Do they always get picked up in the spam folder and they never make it through? I mean, all of those things are part of client experience, right? What are you doing to you know, remove hurdles for them and, you know, forms and paperwork? Are you still faxing stuff to people? I mean, I run into advisors that still have to fax stuff, right? Now, so sometimes in, you know, I mean, you can even run into stuff at the largest custodians where they still need faxes. So it's not always the advisor's fault. But, you know, as we think about that experience across the full spectrum, how do we just keep making that better and better? And the reality is, right, to me, I think if you think about the advisory business and you're worried about fee compression or pressure over over time. We know this is a fact across business models, across, you know, literally generations. People are willing to pay for experience, right? They're willing to pay for a better experience. That is, it's not something new. It's not in, it's not industry specific. It's not country specific. It's not generational specific. You know, there's movements within there, but people pay for experience. If you provide a better experience, people will pay more for it, period, right? Um, so when you think about that, are you transactional in the services that you provide or are you an experience for that client? And you can go further too, if you look at the legal world and the, the doctor world, right? The, the ones that always provided a better experience get sued less. I always liked that research, right? It wasn't about the actual end service where they liked better and they were perceived to offer a better you know, experience. They got sued less. So it's like, end of day, it's not even the end product so much. I mean, those are, yes, the end product should be good, right? I'm not arguing that, but when you take a half step back, right? You're going to make more money. And you're going to get sued less. Okay. That seems like a pretty good reason to do something, right? I don't yeah. like, you know, I'm an attorney. Um, I don't, I don't want to get sued <laughs> because I, <laughs> because my product was the same as somebody else, but I provided a worse experience, right? Like, yeah. there you go. Yeah. Um, so, so, I, so I does, does that speak to the need for more client surveys that ask what we're doing, right? Yeah. What we could do better, what we could do less of more of? Uh, no, I don't think the whole world is just client surveys. Uh, you know, client surveys, you just get a, you know, it, it's hard to get really good survey data in general. And to some degree, you get people who are really angry or people who really like you filling them out. Uh, I do think we just have to be smarter about how we get information. So I do like the one and two question stuff. I, I don't like the end of year, 50 question, tell us everything about the firm. And then you go ask people what their response rates are. And it's like 6%, right. 4%. Yeah. I don't know that we got good information then anyways. Um, so I do like the one question stuff. And I typically tell people, like, if you look at those long form surveys, I bet you, if you have a 50 question survey, there's probably only five that really matter. Yeah. Right. Like you, would you actually change your business on any more than five of these answers, right? Probably not. 
right? Yeah. So then you re- they really don't matter. Um, right. <laughs> like if you're not going to act on them, don't ask them. Yeah. Um, so the like one question stuff, you can ping people. Um, but what we argue for people to do is, is um, actually get advisory councils set up instead. Yeah. Um, so th- we think that's a lot more valuable. We've been doing that for a long time. Uh, you know, some of our coaches, one of my coaches, I mentioned him earlier, Dr. Jerry Herbison. I think every single one, at least some point this year, he, he had said every single one of his coaching members now runs uh, an advisory council. Right. So, but the, the challenge there, it's not easy. Some people aren't great at running them. You got to find the right mix of people, but you shouldn't have all raving fans. It is one really important part of that is some people say, I'm going to get an advisory council. Here's my six best clients. They're yeah. all going to be on it. Yeah. You're not getting good feedback. You need somebody who's not a client. You need somebody who you're not sure if they are a huge raving fan of yours. So you get good feedback. Yeah. Um, and, and typically one of the people I always say to put on it is it's a little funny, but I said, who's the one client that comes into and they tell you about the new restaurant, right? In the area every time. And I said, that's the person you want on your advisory council because they're always looking for the new thing. They're always wanting to tell to people about here's the new thing that happened. So they're going to be willing to do that about your business too, um, because that's how they live their life, right? Here's a new restaurant. Let me tell you all about it. Like we got this and this, and we didn't like this about it, right? Like that's the perfect person. They might not be the person you always want to hang out with, but they're great for an advisory. (laughs) So this may be naive, speaks to my days when I worked at Dalbar, we did these surveys and it's seemingly the two answers that always came up were, um, yeah, my experience is great if they were responsive or mm-hmm. proactive, right? I mean, it's those seem like defaults, right? Uh, yep. uh, that it? I mean, at the end of the day, you responded quickly and you were proactive. Yeah, um, I would say, so proactive is good. And I, I'd say transparency is another one we see. So um, I think we talked about this once before, but I published, it's been two years now, but a, a value of advisor survey that I did, which is like, 1200 households, $200,000 investable assets plus. And um, uh, what we looked at kind of like, what did they like? They rated advisors and likelihood to refer all those types of things. And the driving factors were that one is interaction. So I was surprised in that one um, that the really the satisfaction, likelihood to refer all of that went up after four interactions a year. A lot of people have the kind of standard two and you have the two main meetings. Um, That was not the big break point. The break point was four or more. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean every client likes that, right? Some clients want to be left alone and they don't want four meetings, but um, it was very clear that clients are happier with more interactions, right? You're, you're just right. Like more interactions better. That doesn't mean all of them need to be hour long review meetings, yeah. but you need to be interactive. Um, we typically go under the notion of over communicate rather than under communicate. Yeah. I mean, yeah. honestly, we think there's more risk with under communicating than over communicating. Um, the other one you said, be uh, proactive. I think that's good. Um, Ron always tells a story about, uh, you know, he had a doctor and the doctor you know, was paying for him. And Ron one time called him and said, you know, don't, don't I, don't I need this procedure? And the doctor goes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you really should have had that last year. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and Ron was just like, like, I learned a lesson right then, right? Like I, I don't want to pay for somebody where I have to come to them Right. And remind them of the that things I, I need. Like, I am paying you because <laughs> I want you to bring me those things. Yeah. Right. And that's true for the advisory world too. Right. Nobody wants to have to call you and ask you about stuff. Right. Yeah. Like, they want to know that you have your eye on it and that it's covered. Yeah. Um, and then I brought up transparency and that's the fee conversation. It's never going to end in our world or any world. Right. Right. I mean, these matter everywhere, but um, what I, what the same research I found was, look, people actually care more about fee transparency than they care about the underlying fee itself. Mm. So if you're very transparent with your fee, clients know the fee and how you're compensated before they engage you. We actually see satisfaction pretty much the same regardless of fee structure. Yeah, It, it is not that. So if I understand, right, if I say, hey, hey you know, Bob, this is what you're going to pay. Um, you know, this is what we provide for it. And you agree to it. We're good. Yeah. Right. If you come in and you don't really know how I get paid and what I'm doing for what payment, that's where satisfaction drops down. And I, a lot of advisors still shy away from that. You know, they don't have it on their websites. They don't have clear fee structure. They bounce around. I, I think that we have a long way to go there. Uh, I, I think that 
I mean, I should say, I know there, if we can get more transparent with our fee structures, you will have better, you will have more, and you will have happier clients because this is where all of the data is. It's not a think thing. I know that. Um, And, you know, just think about your own life. Like imagine going and I I use Chick-fil-A. I love Chick-fil-A too. Um, But we could have, we could have picked a burger place, but like, imagine going to Chick-fil-A and be like, I want chicken nuggets. And you're like, all right, we'll give you some chicken nuggets. How much is it going to be? Well, we'll bring out some. And when we figure out how many that come out, we'll then charge you. Yeah. I'd be like, what do you you mean? Like I, no, I just, I want like 12 nuggets. No, we'll we'll bring them out to you and then we'll charge you. Yeah. Based on how many we bring out. And I'm like, Mm. uh, no, I like, like that's not a way that we want to engage. And a lot of the advisory world is like that, right? It's kind of like, oh, well, it depends on what services we provide and you know, how we'll get caught. Like, no, like you'll get clear on it. I don't care if it's commission. I don't care if it's AUM, a mix, a flat fee, but be clear on your compensation and transparent. Yeah. Do, do you find, I mean, I, I, I sense that many advisors, when they, when they say, okay, well, whatever, we charge 1% of assets under management for sake of argument, and, and, and that they have trouble justifying what they do for that 1%, which is quite frankly, a lot is so much behind the scenes, right? Maybe it's compliance. Maybe yeah. it's, you know, internal meetings where you're discussing, you know, their problem or goal and, and their specific circumstance, right? So much goes on behind the scenes that isn't evident to the client. Is that fair? Yeah. Oh, oh it's, it's completely fair. Uh, I, a lot of, and I have some data on that too, on how many like don't feel confident with the value that they can articulate for their fee. It's not what they believe they provide. If you ask advisors, do you think you provide 1% value? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Can you articulate it? Uh, you know, that, that becomes much harder. Part of that is, you know, it's, it's practicing it. So, you know, our coaches work with advisors, I mean, every single week. And I mean, they have a, we have a whole lesson. We've got scripts on it. Like you have to work on your value prop, like anything else, right? Uh, you have to walk through that process Practice it in a mirror, record it, have somebody bounce back off of you, understand what clients are looking for, and then clearly articulate how you're going to solve those problems and work with them. And then remember that like financial planning, wealth management, right? It's not an output, it's a process and solution that you're providing. So if you think every year, and I, it, one of the problems is a lot of people have lived and died off of market performance. And if yeah. you do that, it becomes very hard to articulate your value because you don't control it. Yeah. I, you can't control where the whole market goes. So it's not really your value. Yeah. So, you know, one person I, I know uses return on sleep as part of their value proposition. Okay. And yeah. I love that, right? Yeah. It's, you know, you're here because we provide a return on sleep. These are the things that we watch out for. Here's the yeah. things we provide. Here's what we do throughout the year. And here's what we charge. And, uh, the more you can develop things to help with that in Carson group on the partner side, we have something called life's moments, which is actually, it takes everything in the CRM and actually creates a timeline of actions that the advisor has completed for the client. So it's essentially like a strolled down memory lane. So instead of going to a review meeting and spending all your time talking about what the market did, you go in there and you look back over the last 15 years and all the things you helped them do. And that is a great way to demonstrate past value. Now, that's not saying like it's hard to do that when you're selling the relationship, but that helps long term too, right? Like it's get back to focus on the planning and the meaningful things that you've done for somebody. And, you know, we've heard that conversation too, where one of our advisors was saying every year I go in this same meeting, one of my top clients and every year he says, you know, I think I'm paying you too much. (laughs) And he goes, when we had lice moments and we looked at all the things that we'd done, helping them sell multiple businesses and, you know, the taxes we saved on those and, you know, at 1031's exchanges and some property. And he looked at it and he says, you know, we're never going to have this conversation again <laughs> about paying too much. And, you know, that's, you know, that's a visualization of value that you provided. Yeah. So, you know, you, we, you and I could talk for hours more, but I want to go, I want to th- go through this exercise because I, I, I've lost track of the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't think we're at an hour yet, but we're. <laughs> all right. All right. I want, I, I, I'll stay under an hour for the benefit of our listeners who only have an hour to listen. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention something and give you 60 seconds to respond to it. All right. Um, the testimonial rule. Testimonial rule. Well, that, that's not a good one for me because I, uh, my immediate response is when I hear about testimonials, I, I go to uh, my legal background. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, I, I mean, that's my immediate thought as I think about testimony in court. So it's not a not a All good right. response. Is that, is, common, that how right? we're, yeah, is that yeah is that how we're supposed? So, um, yeah, the testimonial rule, you know, from the SEC side, right, is what you actually want. <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah, not not <laughs> not you your, you wanna, not you your hear from sixty your, seconds. Yeah, raise your right hand up and swear on this Bible. Uh, so this is going to be a really big thing for the advisory world. We, we're looking at it. I, I don't suggest everybody be, um, what I would say, first adopters. I think a lot of people should wait, see what somebody else is doing well, and then follow once you feel a little bit better about it. To be honest, I do not get a ton of advisors, at least at Carson or in our coaching of 1400, that are really pushing to be first out there. There are some, um, but this is a big deal. It'll be important. Uh, I think there's still a lot of like minor complexities, right? About what you can't modify, what you can modify, what you can pull up, what you can't, that brings some risk that I think that if you get too far out there and uh, you could get yourself in a little bit of trouble, so sometimes it's better to kind of be a fast adopter here. But it's going to be big. I mean, that is how people find, right, every other service out there. (laughs) We look up testimonials. We are just getting there. Um, It goes back to that comment I made before. I mean, we're a decade behind everyone, right? Think about how you find attorneys and you you find your landscapers. uh, That's who you ask. And if you look in financial services, very few people ask family and friends anymore for that referral, right? They're looking for testimonies. They're looking for things online. That's where they go first. All right. Robo-advisors? Robo advisors, uh, a lot of people put their guard down on them. Uh, I I think part of it was that robo advisors in the true sense of the word haven't existed yet. And I will still stand by that. I don't believe there's a true robo advisor yet today. And probably some firm will argue differently with me, but most of it was account setup and automatic allocation. It was not true, uh, like advice in a broader sense. It was a very narrow version of advice. And, uh, but we will get there. Uh, That technology, I've seen places working on it. Uh, I, I still think if you look at some of the stuff like Betterment, uh, they've shifted to be more like a traditional financial service company. I know those guys well. I know John Stein well, even though he stepped down as CEO. Uh, you know, they're going to become more advisor focused with you know how do we add this for a market and more traditional advisory on the side. And that's still where I expect RoboAdvice to be in the next five years. All right. Um, Labor Department's uh, uh, rule on whatever, fiduciary, yeah. IRA rollovers, blah, blah, blah. Well, we got we got pushed back a little bit again. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I don't actually have the exact dates, but we got pushed from December into next year yeah. for at whatever it is now. So you just have to look those dates up. I didn't write them down. I used to be more into this every single day, but- yeah. uh, But it's coming. It's been, it's coming, it's here. The biggest thing for me is documentation of rollover advice. I mean, that's the biggest thing that I worry about with advisors. Even if you're right, you have to document this better than you have before. So simple answer is there's a lot of forms out there. Google, like a lot of people put stuff out really more back in like the 2016 timeframe, right? And uh, a bunch of fiduciary organizations says, here's the stuff you need to go grab before you recommend a rollover. Yeah, things have changed a little bit from then. So you might have to modify some of those forms for your business. But I would say, make sure you have a process for that. That's the one thing you're going to get dinged on. That's pretty straightforward, right? You need to be able to document that and you're going to have a conflict. So you need to be able to state the conflict and then also show that this is still in the best interest of the client. That is the single biggest thing that I worry about as it relates to this. All right. So it strikes me as we look at the plethora of new products coming out, that advisors have to become subject matter experts in ESG, private markets, um, crypto. Yeah. Uh, you should not try to become an expert in everything. <laughs> 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 we we have a say, saying, and I sometimes mess this up, right? Become the right librarian, not the library or whatever the saying is, right? Know where everything is. Don't try to house everything. And what you need to figure out is who do you need to go to? Who needs to be the expert for you in that area? So it's just impossible. You cannot be a crypto lending expert and also an ESG expert and an expert on everything alts and then understand what's changing in the 401k marketplace and, you know, manage 529s, 
and rollover processes and look at all the technology that's coming out here. It just can't do that. I don't think anyone can, even if people talk about, you know, well, maybe Michael Kitsis can, Michael can't either. So, you know, Michael, gets not stuck. Michael, maybe Jeffrey. <laughs> yeah. And if Jeff and Michael can't be an expert in everything, then we can't either. So, uh, you know, uh, n- nobody there is an expert, right? Jeff and Michael rely on a lot of people for a lot of different expertise areas and you just can't do that. And if you try to go down that road, you will, cause yourself problems. Right. I especially believe in the crypto and other space, you need to be conversant for clients in it. And I 100% believe that. I do not believe that most advisors should try to become the experts in that. I think that it's better off left to people who want to spend full time on there, just like you shouldn't become the legal expert. You should rely on attorneys yeah. for that legal expertise. All right. So um, we've covered a lot of ground. What did we miss? Something that's top of mind that we should cover before we wrap up? Top of mind. Yes, we did have one more. Have conversations with clients about you know potential legislation and changes. This goes to a lot of the stuff we talked about. Huh. It's being proactive. It is showing that you were on top of it, but it is not meaning that you need to scare everybody, right? That is a big difference. <laughs> you know, the, the big goal there is you can't pretend that your clients are unaware that Congress is talking about legislation. I had an advisor being like, well, I don't want to bring that up. I don't want to put that in their mind. Of course it's on their mind. They don't live in a bubble. They know that there's tax conversations. Yeah. What you need to show is that you're on top of it when something changes. You do not need to scare them into trying to tell all all of them, oh, you know, grats is going to go away. Never mind, grats are going to stay. Like, that's not the point, but that you are on top of it, you follow it, and that you will get information out if or when something changes and that everybody can sleep well because you are working on it. That's really the advisor's job there. Yeah. Uh, and that is an important one because we have been in this never ending cycle of it. And I don't think that's changing. I don't, you know, I don't see any reason to believe that over the next three years with the news and, you know, uh, the delivery of information that that's going to change anytime soon. I think that's the world that we live in today. Yeah. Jamie, I, I've so enjoyed chatting with you. Um, and I hope our listeners enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you too. I, I you know, I, I appreciate everything you do. I respect you a lot. I appreciate you for allowing me to come on here. And I appreciate everyone else that made it through all of this, right? I mean, that's also a, it's its own challenge. They should get a certificate for listening to us, right? You've completed the, the Bob and Jamie uh, conversation uh, skill set. And it's a, it's a good one. But uh, yeah, I guess the closing things, if anyone's interested in coaching, we would be happy to have a conversation. Uh, you know, you can email me directly at jhopkins at Carson group or check out carsoncoaching.com the i'm at at retirement risks on twitter which is probably where i'm most responsive i wrote the book rewirement and if you ever want to talk about running your cheeseburgers i'm always open for that too <laughs> all, right. all right enjoy <laughs> thank you thank you everyone thank you for listening to the exceptional advisor podcast brought to you by the investments and wealth institute If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify, or our website at www.investmentsandwealth.org forward slash podcast to get the latest episodes of our Exceptional Advisor podcast series. For additional resources, updates on events, and exclusive membership deals, visit www.investmentsandwealth.org.